Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We will be starting shortly. If any of you would like to uh, participate and listen to the program in Spanish, once we turn on the interpretation feature, you'll see a small globe appear on the bottom right hand where you're able to select uh, the language that you wish to participate in if you're joining through a computer. If you're on a cell phone or a tablet, you can find the interpretation feature using the three dots where it says more. Hola, gracias por unirse. Nos vamos a comenzar en un momento. Si le gustaría participar y escuchar a la sesión y al programa en español, vamos a activar la función de interpretación simultánea. Cuando la activemos, verán un pequeño globo terráqueo aparecer en su pantalla, donde puede seleccionar si desea participar en inglés o en español, si está usando una computadora, y si usa un celular o una tableta, puede encontrar la función en los tres puntos donde dice más. Comenzaremos en un momento. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. We'll be starting shortly. For those of you that wish to participate and listen in the program in Spanish, we will turn on an interpretation feature where you'll see a small globe on the bottom right hand of your screen. And there you'll be able to select if you wish to participate in English or in Spanish. If you're on a computer, if you're on a cell phone or a tablet, you can find the interpretation feature under the three dot option where it says more. Hola, gracias a todos por unirse. Nos vamos a comenzar en un momento. Si alguno de ustedes desea participar y escuchar en español, vamos a activar una función de interpretación simultánea. Cuando lo hagamos, verán un pequeño globo terráqueo aparecer en la parte de la derecha de su pantalla, donde podrá seleccionar si desea participar en inglés o en español. Si está usando una computadora, si usa un celular o una tableta, puede encontrar la función bajo los tres puntos donde dice más. Muchas gracias. Hello, everybody, and thank you so very much. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm um, having a problem here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate you taking your time out for this very important webinar today. Um, Racial equality and justice can never be achieved until we eradicate and address systemic racism in education. Across the nation, decades of inequitable access to educational resources have created a significant hurdle for children to overcome and achieve academic success. Today, our panelists will discuss how systematic discrimination and racial bias against students of color began and its impact on individuals in our community, as well as our nation. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the program today, ADL Central Division Education Director, Jill Bonke. Jill, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you take it away. 
Thank you, Margie. And thank you for your work preparing for today's program. Before I introduce our amazing panel, I wanna take a quick moment to welcome and introduce you to our new ADL Southwest Education Director, Dr. Chantel Henderson. Um, Dr. Henderson joins us at ADL as a former public school educator. She just completed her doctorate in ethical leadership, and we are so excited to have her join our education team in the ADL Central Division. Um, we have robust ADL education offerings in the Southwest region. Literally hundreds of No Place for Hate schools will start, are anxious to start working with Dr. Henderson this school year to work to build more inclusive learning environments. So we're so excited to have you join our team. Thank you, Jillian. And um, I just want to say I'm just so thankful for the opportunity to join ADL. Um, this is my fourth day. So excited. Um, but I'm really excited about taking the opportunity to transition into the role of a student today. So I am looking forward to listening to our dynamic speakers and just learning. And to all of you, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. We're excited to have you. All right, so the goal of this series is to share examples of systemic racism and their impacts in hopes of conveying a clear understanding of why this must be addressed for our nation to attain racial equity. Um, at the ABL, we believe that there is great value in spending time sharing and listening to each other's lived experiences in an effort to better understand. We appreciate our panelists being here today to give us a window into their world and share their expertise with us so that we can better understand and be agents of change in our own communities. I am very excited to welcome our panel today. Um, Robbie Chatterjee is the Senior Policy Analyst for K-12 Education at American Progress. He joined American Progress from the education consulting firm Whiteboard Advisors, where he worked on a number of issues related to educational technology and state policy research and advocacy. Prior to that, he worked as an education policy fellow for the U.S. Um, House Committee on Education and Labor under Chairman Bobby Scott of Virginia, and he handled a portfolio that included legislation related to uh, school infrastructure and teacher prep preparation. So welcome, Robbie. We also have Jordan Stark. Jordan earned his BS in psychology and with a concentration in education from Davidson College, after which he spent four years as a K-12 educator. He is completing his PhD in social psychology and social policy at Princeton University. His research to date has focused on um, reasons organizations embrace diversity examining the psychological factors shaping people's preferred approaches and the downstream consequences of different approaches. He also examines racial bias and its role in perpetuating, perpet, perpetuating sorry, racial disadvantage, particularly in the context of education and the justice system. Welcome, Jordan. And Cherry Steinwinder. Cherry is one of the founding members of the Center for healing of racism and has been its co-executive director since its inception in 1989. She has worked tireless, tire, tirelessly to build the organization to a nationally respected and recognized um, institution that it is today. She has worked with numerous educational institutions, faith organizations, and has traveled extensively um, conducting workshops for adults. We're excited to have you, Cherry. So, Let's start chatting. Um, I, I'm going to give everybody the same opening question because I really, I really just kind of want to start the conversation based on your. And I'm just going to throw it to you first, Jordan. Um, based on your background, your area of professional expertise, your research, your personal lived experience, where and how should we start this conversation about understanding systemic racism in education? Thanks for that question. And uh, good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody from wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm always happy to speak with people who want to have these conversations. Uh, so to, to the question of where to start, I think the answer has to be history. Um, and as a social scientist, I'll add social science in there with our understanding of history. Um, because racism, specifically anti-Blackness, isn't an accident. It didn't just happen, and it isn't natural or inevitable. It was engineered as uh, engineered very intentionally, and that's very clear 
in the context of education and how it was explicitly used both pre and post emancipation to keep black Americans a perpetual laboring underclass. So given how blatant it is in US history, it shouldn't be controversial to say that our society was built to procure advantage for white people, specifically straight white Christian men with money, right? And so we need to understand the process to which that happens. And we need social science as well to concretize our understanding of how people interact with and perpetuate the society that we inherit from our history. And without that understanding of those basic things, uh, we make egregious mistakes in our assessments of racial inequality. So we have to start with history and our understanding of people and how they relate to that history. Thanks, Jordan. Um, Robbie, from your professional lens, where do we start this conversation? Yeah, uh, also a good afternoon to, uh, to everyone listening and, and, and really excited to be here. And I could not agree with Jordan more. I, I, I just don't think you can talk about systemic racism in education without just really looking at the origins that go far back to before this country even officially became a country. Um, enslaved children, indigenous children, they were forbidden from getting a formal education. Um, and the idea of not giving them, you know, education to minority groups was less of a belief that they were somehow inferior, but a worry that it would give them power and that it would be a threat to the status quo and the white patriarchal society. So, um, you know, that, that really, uh, that, that is the inception of, of so much of what we see today. Um, but, you know, if you want to fast forward to what we're witnessing now, I think that the truth of the matter is, is that one of the problems we have in this country is that we've never really established a baseline or a minimum threshold of what an adequate education in this country constitutes. It's not been declared a fundamental right. And the fact that some students receive a higher quality education than others has not been construed as a violation of people's rights under the Equal Protection Clause. Um, so as an institution in this country, education has been hyper-localized since the beginning. And any attempt to establish a common set of norms, rules, and regulations has generally just been met with intense backlash. And uh, the fact that we don't have a national or centralized school system, but instead are dealing with 50 different state systems, just makes it really hard to have quality assurance across the board. Um, so I think that's where we have to start, that education in this country has almost always been tied to class and economic status. And the idea that it's this great equalizer or that it can level the playing field just doesn't work if the landscape that we're operating on is tilted. I'm hearing the theme of 400 plus years of intentionally built oppressive systems coupled with no national standard or baseline around what, what education should be should be like, look like, feel like for, for students. Um, Cherry, what would you like to add as we start this conversation for you? Where, where, where do we start? I would start at the same time that adults, a lot of them parents, grandparents, relatives, started to read Mother Goose nursery rhymes to their children. And in these Mother Goose nursery rhymes. If I was to read a nursery rhyme about Mary had a little lamb, his fleece was white as snow, I would add to that, that the school that Mary went to only had children as white as snow as that lamb. And I would also explain to them why. I would also let them know that many of the Walt Disney cartoons that we watched, like The Lion King and Snow White, those videos, those films, those DVDs are loaded with sexism, classism, and racism. I would take time to explain that to my children. So, and it really, I want to say that it doesn't mean that our parents were bad. They did the best that they could because this racism, regardless in education or every institution in this country is systemic. One of the quotes that I love using all the time is how to raise racist children. Number one, don't talk about racism. Number two, there is no number two. So we revert back 
to number one. Within the school systems, we can learn how to offset the systemic racism from the moment a child enters school if the teacher themselves are well equipped to have the conversations. And most of all, and most of the time, they are not. Thank you, Cherry. And that's something that, that we work at the ADL to do is to get people comfortable normalizing and finding their voice and, and having conversations about race, being talking about race explicitly. Sometimes we call it racializing our voice, which as a white woman wasn't something that I had to do until I learned to do it, right? And until I was until I was given permission, so to speak, to talk about racism. Um, we have we work we work in our anti-bias trainings to to give teachers that permission if they're not if they're not comfortable with that. Um, very very helpful. Thanks for getting us started, Jordan. I would like for you. I you have an illustration that is very helpful for our listeners and our learners that where you break down what systemic racism is. Will you share that with us? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think it's a framework that's helpful that I use when I taught social justice to my high schoolers. Um, because when you hear the term systemic racism, it's like what is that? The system, the whole system, what, is that just a man? Like, what is this thing? How can I grapple with it, right? Um, and I think we need to be able to sort of uh, break it down into things that are more approachable. Because, um, I mean, systemic racism is a term that's exploded in the last couple of years. In some ways, it's not a departure from what racism is in general. You know, racism is a system of conferring race-based advantage, right? Um, but I like the term systemic racism because it emphasizes that it's not just individuals. It's a whole suite of things that are contributing to this uh, to the system of race-based uh, advantage and disadvantage, right? So um, when I talk to my students about it, there's sort of four aspects of systemic racism, of racism that makes it systemic. You have the personal, the cultural, the institutional, and the structural, right? And I'll break down what each one of those things are. And these things are interrelated. They're, you know, they're not mutually exclusive, right? And they reinforce one another. So personal, I think we're used to talking about, right? That one person did that bad thing. That one person did something that was biased in some way, right? So, you know, a teacher could be biased towards thinking that their black students are uh, more likely to be criminals and then punishes them more harshly than they would their white students for the same behavior, right? Or a teacher is scared of their black students and lowers her standards out of fear of conflict with the black students because she doesn't really want to reprimand them because she's really scared they might be aggressive, right? Um, that teacher and that interaction, that's an example of personal, uh, the personal level of, um, of bias, right? But then within that, uh, in addition to that, you also have cultural bias within the system. You know, and cultural just refers to what's happening at the group level, the interrelation among people in a group, their symbols, their ideas, their ways of being, their ways of relating to one another. At the cultural level, no one necessarily does anything to somebody else. It's just not a culture in which everybody is equally positioned to participate or that equally values people from different backgrounds, right? So to give you an example, um, you know, when I was in college, I had one professor who was really trying to relate to his students and all of his examples, he couched in the context of Friends, the sitcom, right? Popular sitcom, I don't watch Friends. I'm watching Living Single and Martin and like all these black sitcoms, right? So, you know, he was trying to relate to his students. He was relating really well to the white students that got Friends, but for me, it was another barrier to already difficult organic chemistry class, right? And that's just a cultural thing, right? And then culture can go really deep. It's not just cultural references, right? and the ideologies that are embedded in the culture, right? So culture is a lot by itself, right? So you have the personal, you have the cultural, then you have the institutional, right? These are the policies and procedures of organizations, right? A few years ago, there's a lot of attention about schools that were banning certain hairstyles, right? Dreadlocks were illegal in some schools, right? Well, I can't go to that school, right? Especially if dreadlocks mean something to me culturally or as part of my identity, right? Or for example, you know, back in my college days, you go to a club, someone right in front of you walk in with some boots, some shorts on, I was turned away because I was wearing Timberland boots, right? It's not that boots are made illegal, it's Timberland boots that are specifically associated with Black people in hip hop culture, right? So there are institutional policies that formally and informally discriminate, right? right? And a lot of times in our schools, we see that in the curriculum. What do we teach, right? Our ethnic studies departments being banned in schools like the fight in the 1960s, right? Critical race theory now, the big fight about that. Are we fighting for perspectives that affirm the perspective and reality of, of the disenfranchised? Or, you know, what are we fighting over in our curriculum? I know in my personal perspective, uh, you know, undergrad, I went to um, 
I love my my colleague as Feel free to talk about it in a critical way, but you know the 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 curriculum itself reinforced white supremacy, right? Um, and reinforcing an epistemological perspective that was only from white culture. So I took a philosophy of mind course that only approached humanity from the lens of you know a Western culture. That was a big issue, right? And so the professor and I had to talk about some ways to diversify. Uh, the content of that curriculum, right? So there's a lot we could talk about with institutions. Then on top of that, there's the structural level, right? Um, and so the structural level gets even more complicated because these are race neutral, seemingly race neutral policies or practices by institutions that have disparate effects, right? So what do I mean by that? Um, let's take tuition. Schools have to charge tuition if they're gonna run in our society at least, right? But we know that different racial groups are different, have different access to resources. So the more expensive your school is, if you're not providing some sort of compensation for that, the you know the more trouble you're going to have having representation from, uh, you know, disenfranchised groups. It can go from tuition. It can go from reliance to um, admissions tests. If the admissions tests themselves are discriminatory, or different groups aren't able to prepare for those tests at the same level, then that's going to have a discriminatory impact, right? So you have. So when we say systemic, we're talking about the confluence of all of these things, things that are happening on the personal level, the cultural level, the institutional level, and then structural, and how all of those things interrelate to one another, right? And so, you know, part of the reason why it's so hard, because this is a lot, it's complicated, it's fluid and dynamic. And, you know, this system is really responsive to adapting uh, to efforts for social change and responding in ways that reifies the status quo. So when we talk about social change, we need to be thinking about all of these different interrelated levels. But your theme here was within the, the personal and the cultural is intentional intentionally having ed educators decenter whiteness, right? Your friend's example was white centered uh, co connectivity. Um, and so working with educators to have them thinking about how can they decenter whiteness in their classrooms to build a more inclusive space it is a priority for some of those four components. And then the other, the other thing you touched on was access, right? So how do we, how do we remove the barriers to access when it comes to issues of, of affordability for, for higher level education. Absolutely, thank you, Jordan. Um, Cherry, you have a metaphor that helps us under, better, helps people better understand the way systemic racism permeates systems and spaces. Will you share that with us? Oh, you're muted, you gotta unmute. When I was asked to be on this panel, it was very interesting that I really sat with this for a while to be able to give an understanding to people, not so much from an academic space, but life in general. And I thought about a time that I used to smoke cigarettes. Every space that I smoked in, that smoke was absorbed by everything in my home, the curtains, the furniture, everything. When I smoked in my car, the same thing was true. The whole entire car, even if I tried to crack the window, that smoke smell was still in my car. Not to mention my hair, my clothes, everything was absorbed, that everything absorbed that smoke. So I thought about that in terms of systemic racism. And at the time, it didn't seem as though all of these things in my life was absorbing this smoke until I stopped smoking. And when I went into spaces and it took a while for my car and for my home to you know, get rid of that odor, but every time I entered into anyone else's home, I could smell it. It was there. It was foul smelling. So when I look at systemic racism, for people that do not smoke at all, but if they enter into the spaces where that smoke or that smoker had just left, or they may still be there. And even if we talk about secondhand smoke, well, there are people that may be getting the results of secondhand systemic racism, but you're getting it anywhere. It's no way at all within this country from its very beginning, where number one, people of color, you could not be taught to read 
and it was punished by death to make sure the harshest punishment of all. And then it was very interesting too for women under sexism within the educational system. We couldn't go to school. We had to stay home and take care of the cooking, the cleaning, the children and the sewing. And then when we were allowed to enter universities or to be educated, we were only educated in the soft sides where we take care of other people. And then all of the things that went along with that. The last part is look at, as Jordan talked about the curriculum, it was about five years ago that in Arizona, they banned the teaching of Latin history within those books. As if you can teach history in Arizona with, and exclude people of Latin descent. When you look at the books, just here recently, because Texas, you know, is one of the uh, institution, educational institution that sign off on what will be in textbooks. There were things in textbooks that said that people of Latin descent was lazy, et cetera. So it's not just and then look at the teachers. I remember one teach, one woman from England, she was working with me and we went into elementary schools all the time. And finally the woman from London, England said, Cherry, where are all the children of color? No, where are all the white kids? I say, you know where they are, they're in private schools. So when you talk about systemic racism, you're talking about how redlining in this country contributed a large tax, tax break to neighborhoods that were not people of color. And that in itself ensures the wealth of schools and what children will learn. Systemic racism, think about smoking. It penetrates everything. And, and that point that you made about access related to students um, is, is kind of Robbie's area of expertise, right? As a, as a senior policy analyst at um, American Progress, you look really closely at the ways funding structures and pop property taxes impact our schools. Can you help us better understand how these policies impact education? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I feel like I'm going to have to be a little bit of the, the boring history professor here, but it it's important to put it all in context. And, um, and again, I just can't agree more with everything that, that Jordan and Cherry have said. Um, and so I think if you wanna look at where we get the funding disparities that we see in education, I, you know, while you can start way earlier, I think starting after Brown versus Board makes a little bit of sense because that's technically when de jure segregation was ended, right? It was the Supreme Court decided that you cannot have separate but equal schools. But I just want to note that it took a long time after that decision came down for the enforcement of that decision to, to take place. And there's a well-documented history against integration and, and busing efforts. So, um, you know. Especially think, here in Texas, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and it's really everywhere. And I, and I think uh, Terry set me up nicely because I, I just want to note that the federal role in public education uh, is relatively new and it's very small. You know, it, it really only constitutes about 10% of most state education budgets. And it didn't start being a funding stream until after 1965, which is when the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was enacted. So you have lots of years for generational wealth to build up. Um, and in the years after Brown versus Board, you actually see um, a huge exodus of wealth from U.S. metropolitan areas. You basically have white families kind of leaving in droves. You have white flight to the suburbs. Um, you have a huge expansion of private schools, these uh, country day schools, Catholic schools, whatever have you. And it was essentially an extraction of the folks with power, resources, and voice in the education system leaving the public schools in their neighborhoods. And you have this kind of now idea of people shopping for school districts. And this is happening on top of redlining, which I know has already merited a whole other discussion in your theories. But, you know, when you, in, in short, you essentially have people self segregating taking their money with them. And in addition to that, the federal government is refusing to insure mortgages and banks are systematically denying loans 
for housing in predominantly black neighborhoods. So it becomes practically impossible for black families to really own property. Um, you know, all the other ways that, you know, the government had tried to help property ownership for the white middle class through things like the Homestead Act or even the GI Bill, these were not made available to black and brown families. So their upward mobility is hampered. Um, and, and the reason I'm saying all this is because uh, consequently, if, if your predominant source of funding for schools in your neighborhood is local property tax, the value of homes in black neighborhoods went down significantly. New buyers were not encouraged to buy in these neighborhoods. And then over time, one of the biggest funding sources for your schools is chronically underfunded for decades. Right, and you can have state revenue try to make up for some of this, but in most cases, that, that's a really volatile funding source. And when you have a year where there's less sales tax or less income tax, like the year we just had, or if there's a recession, um, then one of the first things to go is generally school funding. And, and then this chronic disinvestment kind of compounds, not just in the schools, but in other aspects of the community, grocery stores, community centers, health clinics, um, they all suffer as a result. And, and this has really just been going on for 65 years. Um, so, and, and this leads to a lot of implications. I, I do wanna note one other really important court case. Um, I know that, uh, you know, it, it's a little wonky, but there was a famous case out of Texas actually called San Antonio versus Rodriguez. Um, and that tried to remedy a lot of this system by saying education is a fundamental right for students and that the property tax-based system of funding schools is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment because it discriminates against lower wealth communities. But the court in probably one of the worst decisions it's ever made uh, didn't uphold either of these arguments and famously said that wealth is not a suspect class because it's mutable. Um, you know, they, they think it, it can change. And so local school funding schemes were actually not subject to strict scrutiny the way some other kind of discriminatory laws are. Um, so what are the implications of all this, right? So, um, and I just wanna kind of try to go quickly through this, but because of this huge gap in, in property tax revenue, there was a group called Ed Build that put out a report a couple of years ago that estimates that the annual gap in school funding between majority white districts and majority non-white school districts is $23 billion, billion with a B annually, right? So, I mean, I think that, that right there is a huge factor in, in what you're seeing in the disparities in schools. And um, if I had to say where the biggest harm comes from in that, it's in school infrastructure, right? The, the lower property values, uh, in, in kind of the funding schemes used to fund schools means that most communities that don't have a ton of wealth can, can rarely put forward a bond measure to raise revenue for capital expenditures on their schools. Um, and if, if you wanna take what that means out to its furthest iteration, it's they, the buildings are old, the HVAC systems are in need of serious repair, the heating cooling systems are breaking down, there is lead in the water, um, it is, it's terrible. You know, a, a 2020 report came out from the Government Accountability Office that said a third of all school systems in the country need to replace entirely their HVAC system. Um, more than half needed to repair or replace a major school infrastructure system. Um, and you can kind of guess where these communities then are concentrated. Um, our team at CAP put out basically a report documenting this as well in, in Maryland, in uh, Baltimore City, in the county, they have a 77% black student enrollment, but only 17% of the buildings are deemed in good condition. Frederick County next door, 13% black enrollment, 100% of the buildings are in good condition. So it's just unhealthy for a lot of these students. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I've, I've gone past the time, but I, I just wanna note that you have this huge funding gap and one of the main ways it manifests is that these school buildings that students are attending and adults, um, you know, the adults in them too, 
are, are really chronically unhealthy. So Roddy, the funding gap is astronomical. Um, but there's a level of intentionality there. It, this, is, this, is, this doesn't come from nowhere and it comes from, and Robbie, your research is related in, in, in bigotry and, and bias, right? It come, this doesn't come, this is, there's an, it's intentional. So can you break down for us how both implicit and explicit, explicit bias contribute to this kind of inequity? Yes, happy to. I'll, I'll try to be concise because I want to leave time for questions. Um, but it's interesting, this study that came out a couple of years ago that compared all these different sources of inequality, uh, whether it's just, you know, uh, black students are going to worse schools or, you know, black students behave differently, or is it that teachers are treating black students differently, right? And it used all these methods to account for how much of the disparities we see. And this was particularly about um, uh, disciplinary disparities uh, in K-12 was attributed to each of those factors. And the number one factor by far was teachers' disparate treatment of Black students for the same behavior, right? And so there's a big role for teacher bias to play and uh, how Black students are treated and their outcomes, right? Um, and, you know, we did a study, my colleagues did a study a little while ago to dispel the idea that some people have that teachers are somehow immune uh, from bias. Uh, and I feel fine saying this as an educator, as a teacher myself, I know we're a well-intentioned group, right? We, you know, have all the best intentions in the world. We come from great backgrounds and we mean well, but that doesn't make us immune from bias. Uh, we're just as biased, if you want to talk about explicit bias, implicit bias, endorsement of uh, bias ideologies, just as biased as the rest of the country, right? And I'm, and I'm not gonna get too much into the implicit explicit distinction because it doesn't serve our purposes right now. Because no matter what kind of bias it is, teachers are just as biased as everybody else. Um, and the long and short of it is that bias has the potential to affect every sort of way you can imagine teachers interact with their students, right? The expectations they have the first day when they see their roster, who's going in that classroom. You know, expectations mean the world in education, how much you think of a student is gonna have a big effect on uh, what, how they actually perform. That's been well-documented for dec decades. It has a direct effect on how teachers grade, right? The identical piece of, um, the identical quality assignment is graded differently based on the background of the student. It has a, di a direct effect on how teachers interact with their students, both in terms of um, instruction and in terms of discipline, right, in a variety of different ways. Um, so I'll just make a, a few points that I want us to know about how bias manifests. One, it starts early, as early as preschool. There's a study that came out a little while ago, I think four or five years now at this point, that uh, tracked teachers' eyes as they looked at a group of preschoolers playing, and they, they were just playing. They weren't doing anything bad. And they said, hey, you know, you know, teachers, being a good teacher, you have to be able to anticipate bad behavior before it actually starts, right? And they measured who they looked at. And the majority of, te and the majority of people spent the majority of their time looking at the black boy in the group, right? You anticipate that even this you know, four-year-old is going to be the problem student, right? So it starts early, starts as early as preschool. Uh, it applies not only to black bodies, but also to black ways of being. There was a study that had people walk with a stereotypical black swagger. And whether or not they were actually black for white students too who walked in this manner teachers expected that students who walked in that quote unquote black way uh, would perform worse academically would have worse behavior and they expected to have to refer them to special education at higher rates right and when we talk about bias it's not all about animus right matter of fact most of the modern ways in which bias is expressed is not about animus or hating people who are different from you it's about discomfort right it's about anxiety Right, it's about liking other people better, right? Not necessarily disliking some group, right? In all these ways. So, you know, one study showed uh, that uh, teachers' bias led to worse outcomes for the students, for the black students that they taught. And it wasn't because, you know, they didn't like these students. It was because their anxiety caused them to teach worse, right? So they're anxious around black students for some reason, right? It could be a variety of reasons, but that anxiety reduced their lesson quality and then it reduced the performance of students. And they later gave the same uh, lessons to white students and their performance was also worse because the lesson quality was worse, right? Um, so bias has the potential to affect education in any way that you can imagine that teachers interact and influence the outcomes of their students. That is an excellent point. I feel like our own internal bias paired with our own anxiety manifested in, in it, it, it's real, we're human. And I watched this happen. It's one of the reasons I worked for ADL. I worked in a suburban Houston school district post Katrina, when we had Katrina evacuees come to our predominantly white campus who were mostly students of color, 
those students ended up in in-school suspension. They ended up with dress code violations. They ended up with special ed referrals in, a, in, in disproportionate numbers. And, um, and that's exactly what you're describing, Jordan, right here, um, playing out. This has been a really great conversation. There's so much just to, to discuss. Um, and there's so much intentional oppression to unpack, um, way more than an hour's worth of time. But I want to make sure that there's a lot of questions in the chat. So if it's okay with you guys, can I can I pull some of these questions out of the chat? Because I think that um, some of them are really, um, really great. So um, the first question is, how would you start to explain systemic racism to a six-year-old girl who is mixed race, first grader, looks white, um, two parents who are African-American, um, and the challenge of CRT in educate, you know, the, the critical race theory um, politics at play, uh, asking for a friend, LOL. Who wants to take that one? Uh, I'll let Jordan, you want to start? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, this exercise I always do that. They do this, take, this time for concision, but I think it helps to really illustrate the problem. All right. So everybody listening at home, I want you to repeat after me. Um, all right, I'm going to say a series of words, repeat those words, and then I'm going to ask a question. Don't repeat the question, just answer the question, okay? So I'm going to say a series of words, repeat each word after me, and then answer the question. All right, here we go. Bop. Drop. Repeat it after me. Top. Flop. Cop. What do you do when you come to a green light? Stop. So the question was, what do you do when you come to a green light? Oh. And I bet you the majority of people said stop, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Uh, those of you uh, who've seen the way the road works, I, I believe you know differently. Uh, you believe you're supposed to go when you see a green light, right? And, you know, baby girl, the six-year-old, she'll understand that too, right? But, you know, there's all these things in our environment, right, that can affect the way that we think, right, um, and cause us to do things that might not be what we really believe and might not be what's best, right? And so, you know, our world is complicated and we've inherited a legacy in which everybody hasn't been treated fairly, right? And that affects our culture today, right? If you just drive around town, who's living in the wealthy sections? Who's living in the poor sections, right? Who's in positions of power at your school? Who's not, right? All of these things influence how we treat people, right? Uh, even if we're not thinking about it, right? So we have to be really mindful about that, right? And, you know, this, we talk about systemic racism, we talk about all those things that are the bops, the drops, the cops, the flops, right? And how that make people behave and shape the world that we live in. And we have to be mindful that we're doing that in a fair way, right? So that's sort of how I would uh, illustrate it to a, a six-year-old. That's, that's helpful. Can we talk a little bit about how um, systemic racism affects um, the Latinx population, Asian people, you know, the Asian, Asian people who identify as Asian? Um, I There's a question in here, um, you know, about just other ways racism affects, I guess, um, other populations. Uh, well, let me say, Jillian, first and foremost, for the last probably 40 years in my life, I have three daughters of Asian descent, one from Hong Kong, one from Beijing, and one from Taiwan. And we have these questions and these conversations and these dialogues all the time. First and foremost, State Farm gave the money to put out a complicated com a pamphlet, a book. It was very small about how so many people of Asian descent live their lives in the United States. And in that publication, it noted that because of the stereotypes that all Asians are good in math and science, you know, they all smart, that many teachers will not offer them help. Many of the school counselors will not offer them help because after all, you know, they are already geniuses and they would not need the help. That's one thing. Another way it affects people of Asian descent is to be able to never ever be seen as totally American. It's always that question, where are you from? Where are you from? But it's not just that. It's about the standard of beauty because I know 
that one of my daughters almost committed suicide or tried to commit suicide three times because she didn't fit the standard of beauty, which is held up to us as a standard from England, a standard from Europe. Another way that it affects my daughters is to be able to look at other human beings and not to be able to validate and value themselves individually that yes, I am an American, even though my ancestors have been here three and four generations. For the other, my daughter from Guatemala, my daughter from Guatemala, been in this country now 25 years and she still talks about the way that people look at her as if she don't belong and it's always go back to where you came from to be able to not being seen as a full human being within this country and to even have that enforced in some of the education that these kids get in school so when I look at this when I look at COVID happened last year, and because of COVID, oh, gee whiz, the hate crimes on people of Asian descent just exploded in this country. But when I'm in speaking engagements, in fact, I'm having a good dialogue with a mother right now that I don't even know that of Chinese descent that's sending me all these emails about the rise of hate crimes she's experienced. And what I wrote back to her, see, that's also why I say the educational system failed them because it did not talk about the history. And you see, to talk about lynchings of black people, there were lynchings of people of Chinese descent in this country too. And one of them was under 10 years old, a little child lynched. So we are not giving students a complete education of what American history is. And for people to constantly go around calling COVID, the Kung Fu virus and all of that, that in itself is aiding to what is happening to people of Asian descent right now. To be able to look at people of Latin descent, people from the Middle East, hey, it's almost like, gee whiz, everybody get a turn in this country to be totally dumped upon, discriminated against, and all of us have these stereotypes that we live our lives under. So that's, that's absolutely, Terry. The ADL has seen a 17% of hate crimes targeted against people from the AAPI population just in the last calendar year because words matter and hate escalates into violent, violent actions when people um, when people use words in derogatory ways and place blame. Rebecca made a really important um, point in the chat that I want to remedy. She says, thanks for the discussion so far. Can we think of a different way to talk about CRT politics? Um, our Western colleagues hosted a webinar a few weeks ago with Dr. Beverly Tatum and Mark Dollinger. And Dr. Tatum so eloquently said in, re in, in response to the boogeyman that people are deploying that is critical race theory or talking about history and systemic oppression to young people in, K, in a K-12 setting, you can't remedy what you can't talk about. And so understanding the, um, the approach from, from people to whitewash American history is, is a type of oppression in itself is something I wanna call out that Rebecca um, mentioned in the chat. I think I, 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 may have, I may have made the mistake in just calling it CRT politics and it's, it's much bigger than that. So I, I wanna remedy that. I saw Jordan unmuted and then I wanna finish up our hour with some resources. But Jordan, what were you going to say? So many thought provoking uh, things happening here. I'm just like, oh, there, there were a lot of things I was gonna say. Which one <laughs> do I wanna respond to now? Um, yes, I mean, so... I, I am gathering to, to be concise here. Um, yes, I also I wanted to, to piggyback on what what Sherry said, and then also you know what you what you just mentioned as well. Um, so in terms of thinking about systemic racism in a way that's that's not just focused on blackness, right? Um, I think part of the theme of what I'm hearing that's been said over the course of this hour is that we have to situate everything in this unique history and context, right? So, um, you know, oppressions against other people of color, right, are unique in terms of their own histories in the U.S. and, you know, their relationship 
to uh, the white dominant group in US status quo, right? Uh, so they are unique, they're overlapping similarities because they're all systems of racialized oppression, but there's also uniqueness across groups and then also within groups, right? When we talk about, everybody wants to say intersectionality, right? And how your overlapping identities create unique experiences of oppression or liberation, right? So for example, Sherry was talking about the perpetual foreignness that's associated with Asian American communities. Yes, that's true, uh, but that, that is uh, not as strongly the case if you're a gay Asian American, then you're seen as more American, right? Right, And there's different sorts of oppressions, like if you're a black female, then if you're um, a black male, right? So there's a lot of complexity there. And so part of the solution uh, where we need to start is understanding these, these unique histories uh, for all these groups of people and not to think writ large, but also we have to understand these as part of one system of white supremacy. That's what it all serves, right? When you analyze how these work, all these structures of oppression are serving to maintain a status quo that privileges wealthy white male Christians pre predominantly, right? So we have to understand how all these things work in an interlapping fashion, but also have their unique history. Um, and, you know, to the point that we need to, there's also a question in the chat about, you know, how do we talk about this? What's, how, what's the response to the counter that, you know, uh, high school age kids aren't ready for this, right? And also to Beverly Tatum's point about, you can't, uh, you know, address what you don't talk about. You know, I think when people say high school kids aren't ready for this, they mean white high school kids, right? And this is also related to, um, you know, how do we talk about uh, whiteness in the context of this conversation, right? There's a, um, Eric Knowles is the scholar at NYU who wrote a good paper. His basic framework is that, you know, you have to understand, you know, white people have a set of responses they can have to when they're confronted with the reality of their race-based race advantage. They could deny, distal, distance, or dismantle, right? They could deny their privilege, right? They can distance themselves from their privilege. And what that looks like is saying, actually, no, but for me, I had to work really hard. My family, we also had to struggle, right? I'm not privileged personally, right? Or can they work to dismantle uh, the system that's given them, uh, you know, disadvantage, right? So, you know, we have to understand, you know, the psychology that's shaping how, you know, white dominant group members are affected and, and implicated in all of this. And, you know, for our non-white students, learning these histories is actually an, can be an important part of their socialization and their resistance and their participation in a political structure, right? So you can say for non-white students, this is vitally important to their survival and thriving in a system that is oppressing them. They need to understand that. Right, so that's me uh, sort of ranting to address a few different things that came to mind. No, but I love the three Ds. Those are really helpful, especially especially as a white woman. Those those are very important to keep top of mind. Robbie, there you... was oh, but the there was a question. I think the first question that she posed that was in the chat, having to do with the person that you know, look white that had parents of African descent, and one of my best girlfriends. That's exactly, everybody thinks she's white and it, she resents it. She totally resents it because both of her parents are black. And at the same time in resenting that of how that is passed on to her kids. And one of the things that I do know about her is that she can go and fit in with white culture and be denied entry into black culture. So it is a really, you know, hard space to be in when emotionally you're connected to the people that you don't look like, but at the same time you're connected to the a group of people that you know you look like. It, it it's a very very hard situation. It's a very interesting dynamic too because in Florida, that when the mother, African American parents gave birth to two uh, twins, one was totally white and the other one was totally black in appearance. And their lives were totally different, but they came from black parents. And so that brings about a whole different thing about DNA and all of that. But I really feel that one of my children, my godchildren, father was African-American, mother was European-American. And he totally took on the value of whiteness because he looked white with those two parents. And he frankly told me that he was better looking because he was white. Yes, he was better looking because he was white and how all of that plays out too. And how that's reinforced in classrooms too. Absolutely. Robbie, I wanted to give you some airspace before we go around the horn to share resources and, and talk about change making. What do you have to add? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there's been a lot that's been, uh, you know, 
uncovered and unpacked and I, and I think it's there's as you can see it's just it's really complex um you know I I think going back to what what Jordan and Sherry had brought up too I think it's like white supremacy really does kind of uh you know for lack of a better word color all this because it's often used to wedge these different communities you look at the AAPI community in particular um and and you know this this kind of trope that's often said about them, this uh, you know model minority kind of uh, concept, uh, you know, and it, it's been used really, uh, you know, um, in kind of an evil way of like, oh look, they did it, why can't you do it, right? Like it, it's just like it's it's and it, it completely negates the history of how they got here, class, um, with not to mention the mass differences within the API community when you're talking about. Hmong and, and Lao Asian refugees versus, you know, folks with a PhD from, from India or China coming over. That's vastly different starting point. Um, so anyhow, I, I, I know we can keep talking about uh, a lot of this. I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how, uh, what the, you know, the, the term and CRT has become obviously just like into the media so quickly without even being explained as essentially a, a, a legal uh, you know, framework. So I, I, I don't know if you could just call it unvarnished history. And, and to Jordan's point, it's, I think everyone is ready for it because it's the truth. I think it's, it's just how people look at this country. I think that I was watching a documentary and, and someone said it nicely, um, that someone was former President Obama, but he was like, when white people like, like look at the country, it, a lot of it sounds like this you know, they, they see America as a John Philip Sousa stars and stripes forever ballad, whereas a lot of communities of color see it as, as a jazz composition with lots of disparate notes and kind of blue notes and, 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 it, and it, you know, it just, it, it's a different, you know, experience that they're having. So I, I think that's, that's just one thing um, I just want to note and we can now get to the resources. I think I've seen like an appetite from the, the folks about how do you start solving this? And I think, unfortunately you do have to just, it's going to take more discussion. You can't, you can't treat what you don't diagnose. So things like this obviously help. There are lots of grassroots and community organizations that are starting to do the work and I'm going to paste them in in a minute. So. Thank you, Robbie. I think we only have four minutes left, but I do think that um, that's an important theme. You can't, you can't fix what you don't diagnose. Um, and I, I, I don't know that this is, I think this is only generations of work, um, but I know that there are a lot of people who are ready to start doing that work. So um, Carrie, Jordan, Robbie, what are the resources, the things that our listeners could be using um, to become, you know, to work in, in building more equitable education systems to being change makers in their own community? What do they need to know? Well, for 32 years, that's exactly what the Center for the Healing of Racism has been involved in. And I am so fortunate because I started in kindergarten all the way through postgraduates and beyond. So I have stories and histories from little children, from elementary, from high school, from universities. And so it will be very difficult now because of the bill that was just passed that will go in effect next month, signed by the governor, the what SB3 bill, it's going to mute a whole lot of us. So what I am saying to everybody, and especially when I'm working in faith-based communities, the church is going to have to take on the role of educating their children now, because you're not going to be able to do it in schools. It's going to be very difficult until something happened to overturn what is about to happen within this country. And we have a we have a webinar next week all related to CRT that Margie can put in the chat where there are a lot of educators, especially even in our state, who are saying we're still talking about this history. So we'll see how this all plays out. I have some hope, Cherry. Jordan, final resources, final thoughts. What do you have for us? Yeah, so I think it goes back to just the framework I, I stated at the beginning with looking at the different levels in the system, right? Um, you know, if you want to talk about change, you need to be working at all, all of those levels. And it's hard. Um, you know, we can't be satisfied with just being a kind person, a culturally competent person. Uh, that's that's a start, right? But we have to be working at the level of policy 
We have to be level working with people like myself, who I consider us to be sort of tinkerers, right? How do we manage and mitigate the problems we have knowing that we're in a racist society? How do we make it less bad, right? But that's never gonna solve the problem of racism, right? So, so I would recommend that educators work with researchers and, and scholars to try to implement things uh, that, can, that, that can manage this problem that we have. And that's gonna be, a, it's a long-term uh, fight. Uh, this isn't something that's like when able that it will be done and finished, right? So understand this as a long-term commitment that requires, you know, a personal commitment, but also social political commitment, right? And think on all those levels. I thank you, each of you, for your time and your expertise. Robbie, Jordan, Cherry, we, we so appreciate you help, helping us learn and grow today. Um, thank you to our um, to our listeners, we appreciate your engagement and you tuning in. Um, Margie put in the chat our, our, another webinar that may be of interest to you, and um, we appreciate you. Be safe and be healthy. Thank you so much.